to all. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'm Simone Cavallaro, the director of the Steeler Center. We're excited to host Fami Kadir for a conversation on short selling and beyond with Luigi Zingales, our faculty director. Before we start, please note, we're on the record and video recording the event. So please silence your phones. As usual, the views expressed by our guests are their own, not, not those of the Stigler Center or the University of Chicago. As you may know, the Stigler Center promotes and diffuses research on regulatory capture and the various distortions of special interest groups imposed on capitalism. capitalism. We have many initiatives, including the Capitalism Podcast, co-hosted by Luigi and Kate Waldock. So please check it out and, and leave a, <clears throat> a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Back to this afternoon. We look forward to an insightful conversation with our speakers. Fami is the founder and CIO of, of Safek, Safket Capital, a short-only fund which she started last year. Previously, she managed investments at Crane Savage Asset Management, where she played a key role in successfully shorting Valent Pharma. Prior to that, she worked on an advisor, as an advisor to global pharma companies. She holds a bachelor's in math and biology from Harvey Mudd College, and she was recently chosen for the 2018 Forbes 30 Under 30 in finance. She was also featured in an episode of the original Netflix series, Dirty Money. If you haven't seen it, you should. It's a great show. And last but not least, due to her courage and skill in uncovering fraud, Fam is also known as the assassin. So guys, watch <laughs> out. <laughs> Luigi is uh, <clears throat> the McCormack Professor of Entrepreneurship and Finance and the Charles Harper Faculty Fellow at Chicago Booth. He's also the Faculty Director of the Stigler Center. Please join me in welcoming our speakers. So, first of all, thanks for coming. My and, pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here, and you seem to have kept a few steps along the way because you came here sort of teaching a business school without having followed one. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I, I, I honestly haven't had any formal training in finance or accounting. So, <laughs> uh, But you seem to be doing fine uh, no matter what. Uh, but... Uh, you know, be, being at Chicago, I don't want to spend time uh, sort of uh, celebrating the essential role of uh, shorting. I think that uh, all of uh, us, we know that. But uh, most people think about shorting still as kind of uh, a dirty job, that you have to do it, but uh, better not be me. Uh, in fact, uh, a former colleague of mine wrote a paper about shorting, mentioning uh, some uh, uh, quotes and then... Uh, and uh, some, member, uh, some congressman uh, said that uh, short is un-American, is sort of bad, and all those things possible. Now, what uh, is intriguing about uh, your career and your fund is that you soon be do, to be doing uh, shorting with a purpose, with a social purpose. Uh, can you explain us how sort of a, a millennia got interested in shorting for a social purpose? Well, I'll have to give you the whole Genesis story, because if I'm, if I'm being free with you guys... I never expected to be a short seller. It sort of found me serendipitously. Um, if you followed my story at all, um, my first love was mathematics. And mathematics really dictates how I think about the world and, and how I approach everything that I do. Um, it's in how I ask questions, how I investigate. So for you know, the majority of my life, I thought I would be sitting here not speaking to the business school, but speaking to you know, mathematics <laughs> students. But uh, here I am. Uh, short selling is fundamentally about asking questions. It's asking questions that really no other investors want to ask, usually because the truth is the hardest thing to hear. Um, so where did I, how did I end up, you know, being a mathematician and, and then becoming a short seller? So um, during my gap year, um, when I deferred my PhD, um, de deferred matriculating, I worked in consulting, but I would say it was corporate intelligence. Um, largely what I was doing was I was hired by these large pharmaceutical companies to go and um, dig deep, um, in, engage in forensic investigative work against their competitors. Um, and that's really where I started to see where all the, the bodies were buried in uh, corporate America. 
when you, you grow up on Wall Street, let's say you do the traditional path of, you know, two years of investment banking, go back to business school, no offense, but then, you know, go on and, and perhaps work on the buy side, you're always exposed to the narrative that these corporations want you to hear. Um, they're telling you that they're giving you the numbers, they're giving you the questions that you should be asking and, and basically telling you your investment thesis. Um, but growing up the way I did, you know, where I didn't really see all of that, I didn't see the Wall Street narrative, um, it was really about um, seeing what goes on behind the scenes and what drives decision making in boardrooms and, and within um, these companies that are potentially committing fraud. What compels these companies to commit fraud? And, and really, I saw that when I was working in corporate intel. Um, but, you know, as I moved up the ranks in corporate intel, it became less about the research and more about selling projects, bringing in new clients. Um, and at that point, do I go back and do my PhD? Um, so there's this place that was, you know, building up in New York, the Museum of Mathematics. Um, I was very involved because Harvey Mudd was involved in, you know, creating, you know, the curriculum and uh, curating, and a lot of my professors would stop by there. But it was also a hedge fund community. Um, so the folks there asked me if I ever considered working in investment management. Um, so serendipitously, <laughs> I ended up working in investment management. They had introduced me to uh, my former fund, and by virtue of the questions that I, would, I was asking him about his investments, um, he saw that I was a natural short seller. Uh, they were basically long only at the time. Um, they needed someone to build out a short book as they were raising more assets. Um, so there I was, zero official finance or accounting training, um, start my first hedge fund job and have my own you know, investment decision-making power and P&L power, um, the remit to build out a short book. I don't think most people get that opportunity, but it was by leaving myself open to these experiences that I sort of found myself becoming a short seller, and it happened to be the right role for me. When you said a natural short seller, what does it take to be a short seller? Well, you know, I think we all know that short selling is not the easiest way to make money in the markets. If you want to be a billionaire, go and start a long short fund where you find the best long ideas and you get all the, your, your long-term capital gains and you have some sort of index hedge on the short side. Um, and, you know, short, shorting for alpha generation isn't necessarily a profitable enterprise. Um, so for me, I'm compelled to be a short seller because I like to find what's wrong in these companies. You know, when I was, whether it was when I was a mathematician and, you know, and as far as bringing together pieces of evidence and asking certain questions, um, when I was in corporate, in the corporate world, um, short selling is really about getting to the truth and being right more so than it is about being, about making money. Obviously, there is a profit component, um, but I think short sellers are more driven by the fact that they're predominantly against the markets and against consensus at all times. Um, but so they really need to work hard uh, to make sure the facts are on their side um, to prove their case. So you really have to be a bit of a masochist to be a short seller, and I think that's sort of a fundamental personality trait. It's not something you can learn. But you said you have to be right. You also have to be right in the right time framework, because if you're right in the long term, you are sort of uh, broke before people recognize you're right, right? Well, exactly. But, but for me, the, the definition of right is simple. Have I made money or have I not made money? You know, I think there's a lot of these philosophical discussions about you know, being right on a short idea, but you end up losing money or going out of business. And I'm, I'm starting a fund that is short only, and I'm unhedged against the market. So I need to be right in the financial sense. I need to make money on my ideas. So for me, every, every trade that we put on... It, it, being right means not only being right in exposing the elements of fraud and understanding how the company is fundamentally deteriorating, it's also about understanding the time scale within which that happens. So even though we just you know, began trading in January of this year, 30% of my portfolio has been turned over. Not because I was losing any significant amount of money, but the, the time scale will change um, as your investments progress and as new facts um, come to light. So to really stay in business as a short seller, you, you have to get out of that mindset um, that being right can be some sort of esoteric philosophical idea of being morally right. Yes, we can be morally right, but in order to do that sustainably, we have to be able to make money. <laughs> so tell us a bit about uh, your most famous uh, short up to this point, which is Valiant. How did, did this come about and how does it compare? Because uh, 
in the Dirty Mavic movie, they compare uh, to the famous or infamous uh, Pharma Bra, right? That uh, everybody criticized. But tell us, what, uh, what was the strategy of Valiant vis-a-vis -vis the strategy of everybody else and what made uh, such an attractive target for you? Well, one thing that I've learned over the you know, short three years that I've been doing this is when corporations that are in established industries suddenly try to throw out the rule book completely and fix what wasn't broken, then usually there's, there's something um, that's questionable. That, that's not necessarily going to be sustainable over time. So when you have, you know, I was first exposed to Valiant when I was doing corporate intel because I had clients, um, you know, the top five pharmaceutical companies in the world. Um, you know, I, I worked for the largest at the time, and they were interested in what Valiant was doing. They, they were confused by how Valiant was able to maintain significant margin on products that didn't enjoy the patent protections um, that a lot of their branded drugs do. So how did they protect themselves against the, the loss of exclusivity on those drugs? Um, and as you dig deeper into to how Valiant was achieving those things, it became clear that this is not a way to sustainably make money in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, you, you can't just throw away the basic tenets of being able to spend money on R&D and develop new drugs um, and enjoy patent protection and the pricing power that comes with that innovation. Uh, you can't just throw that all, the way, uh, all away and, and sort of exploit these loopholes in the reimbursement and, and uh, regulatory environment in the United States. So that was the, you know, the first thing. Um, the other thing is when the numbers look too good to be true, it's, it's, you, they're usually not true. Um, so you have to really understand, get to the, the basic idea of you know, what are they doing to accomplish this. And when you kind of start to peel the onion, it's very clear that they, they were walking a very blurry line of what is legal and what is ethical in, um, in, you know, in the pharmaceutical industry. And for us, uh, it was very clear from the beginning. If you just looked at the drugs that they were selling, and it, the data showed it. You know, it was very clear from the beginning that Valiant was just increasing prices while the volumes, you know, the, the number of patients that were taking these drugs were dropping off. Yet somehow, the investment community avoided looking at these very basic numbers. Um, you know, anyone who has a Bloomberg terminal can access pharmaceutical data, but no one wanted to analyze it because, again, people don't want to get to the truth because, you know, they can benefit from things being too good to be true. So I think that this is uh, the business model of most of the pharmaceutical industry, no? Um, obviously, the pharmaceutical industry, they want to make profits, right? And they should make profits. They're not alone in that. <laughs> They're not <laughs> alone. There's nothing bad in that. <laughs> the, right. But the thing was, the difference between a traditional pharma company and Valiant was that Valiant was taking products that were decades old, had no patent protection, um, and were increasing the price multifold. 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 percent on those drugs that had absolutely no competition, but they, they also had no patent protection. Um, That's so exactly like the Pharma Bro. Exactly like the Pharma Bro, but he did it on just one drug. Uh -huh. Valiant did it across its entire portfolio. So, and so why did he get exposed so like uh, this uh, terrible guy and uh, Valiant much less so? Well, people like characters, mm -hmm. and he was, of course, a character. He was the one who really... Um, made you want to hate the pharmaceutical industry. Mm -hmm. Because when you see his face on the TV, I mean, <laughs> I'm sure all of you had similar feelings about what you want to do to this guy. Uh, but apart, apart from that, uh, he, he did, he, what he did was on such a small scale. Um, he took what Malik was doing and, you know, kind of laid it bare. He had no pretenses. That, you know, where he, he didn't try to say that we're doing this for the good of the people. He, he said, you know, we're trying to make money. Whereas Valiant was trying to, you know, is the wolf in sheep's clothing. You know, we're a big pharmaceutical company. We're helping people. Uh, we're, we're donating billions, billions of dollars to patient assistance charities. Um, yet they were doing pharma bro tactics um, at such a, a, such a large scale. But this stuff is clearly not uh, ethical, but uh, it's not technically illegal. So for you to take in the risk of shorting, uh, people might sort of decide that uh, that's perfectly fine. That's the, those are the rules of the system, and they can keep keep going. There wasn't not, uh, and maybe I missed some important point. Uh, there wasn't like a open fraud there in the sense that uh, when you know that when you expose the fraud, then uh, they have to 
uh, unfold the company. Well, the issue with the reason I shorted Valiant when I did had less to do with the unethical business model. The unethical business model is what makes me look at Valiant and what motivates me as a person. I've, I've always been sort of a Pollyanna and you know, I'm motivated to correct wrongs in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I, I am a short seller. But with Valiant, um, there was more, it was a confluence of factors. It wasn't just that, yes, there was always the underlying unethical business model. Um, but they had also taken on a massive amount of debt. And when it, you're a company that your, your primary, you know, what's working for you is the fact you have a Canadian tax base, you are a levered roll-up, then once you can't have access to capital or that ca cost of capital starts to increase, then your business model will start to unravel. That, that ending is never pretty. So for us, you know, on the timing, it was really about the leverage because the business model comes to an end when you can't acquire more um, to sort of show this fake growth. Um, so, so there was that, but um, the unethical behaviors did start to trickle into potentially illegal behavior, and we still have yet to see, see what is going to be, be the outcome of that, because Valiant is still under um, severe uh, regulatory uh, scrutiny and litigation related to RICO violations, False Claims Act violations, so we do believe there is fraud there, and it comes down to reimbursement fraud, insurance fraud. Um, so yes, usually when a company is engaged in unethical behavior, you can't put it past management um, to kind of avoid fraud. Usually they go hand in hand. Yes, but uh, we know that, for example, the infamous farmer bro was uh, convicted for something else. So when you are the villain, uh, then they find your way to put you in jail. No? <laughs> Well, if only things were so efficient. <laughs> so, uh, un you know, there's, there's so few resources out there to actually go up against corporate crime. And something that is as massive as Valiant, there's so many different pieces here at play that it will take significant amount of time. But this is where short sellers come in handy. We're sort of a first line of defense against prosecuting corporate crime because what we do, the basis of what we do is it's always about collecting evidence to prove our thesis. Um, and in our case, we exclusively go after companies that are potentially committing fraud. So as we collect that fraud, we, we package it, put it on a silver platter, and send it to the regulators. Um, because ultimately, that makes their job easier. Um, and, and hopefully, one day, they, these guys will <laughs> end up in jail. First of all, we know we not, cannot trust the regulators that well. And so, so people have complained about matter for many years, and the SEC did not do anything about it. And so, do you really package and give it to the regulator first, or do you give it to the newspapers first, hoping that then the newspaper will pressure the regulator to do something? It's, it's all goes hand in hand. Um, it, it really depends on the type of information we're trying to get out there. Um, we don't take activist positions. Um, so, you know, Safket is not out there publicly providing our research, you know, on any outlet. We're not, um, you know, on Twitter. We don't have a blog. Um, so, one of from the, the work that we do, we need to do. We need to get that out there. We obviously want the truth to be told. Um, so sometimes we'll go to journalists, but journalists don't always want to publish everything. Um, so really? <laughs> <laughs> Tell us. <laughs> uh, well, the the things that we do expose us to significant amounts of risk. Uh -huh. um, you know, companies don't want the truth to get out there. Um, they don't want you to be asking those questions, and um, they'll do whatever is in their power to intimidate those who are seeking to tell the truth. Um, and e even at Safket, even though we are not publishing research, um, we've faced significant amounts of cyber intimidation, hacking, um, you know, physical surveillance, just because we're... By companies. By companies, just because we are researching them. Uh, so journalists won't always publish, and, and there are reasons for that. Um, so in those cases, uh, where there are really concerted efforts to um, prevent the truth from getting out there, you know, Sometimes the regulators is really just the last line of defense. Yeah, the last line that they often doesn't and, and work if that anything, well. <laughs> if, and, and if anything, if, as long as we, if we sent the evidence and, and one of these companies comes and kills us, at least, <laughs> at least the truth is there. <laughs> wow, that's a pretty dangerous life. Uh, but uh, you had uh, a lot of courage because at the time, uh, on the Valiant side, there was Bill Heckman, who is like considered like a phenomenal investor, very famous, very prominent in, uh, in the media world, etc. And uh, 
he, if I remember correctly, he doubled down. He was very convinced of the business model. He really backed it up. He, um, what gave you the confidence to sort of uh, go against uh, uh, such a personality like Bill Hackman? Well, you know, I don't come from the world of finance, so, you know, I wasn't looking at the other side and saying, you know, I, I wasn't cowering down because there is a master of the universe on the other side of my trade. Um, all I could do is do the work, do it honestly. Um, and that's actually, you know, how I, I was named the assassin for a, a <laughs> long time because I wasn't really part of any sort of community. I didn't really know there were short sellers, journalists out there. Um, I didn't know about... Um, these, these big investors who are going long, uh, though I was familiar with their thesis, um, I would just do the work. And then, you know, I, that work would get out there, but it wouldn't be attributed to me. Um, so then, it, you know, it was attributed, attributed to the assassin. And then people then realized who the assassin was, and it was me. But again, it was just about keeping my head down and doing the work and making sure I was right. And starting out, this was the second trade I ever put on. Um, in, in my entire career as a professional investor. So I had to be right, um, especially since I had somehow convinced um, my, my boss at the time to make it a 10% position. And that was our cap for position size, long or short. So I needed to make sure that I was right, because if I wasn't right, then you know, I, I was out of the business and I'd have to go back and do my PhD. <laughs> 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 so um, you know, I, it was interesting because... Um, Bill Ackman and I shared common uh, LPs. Mm -hmm. So the LPs would come and, and meet with me and we'd talk about Valiant and they'd tell me what um, you know, Bill would say to them and then I would go through my, the work that I've done uh, and then they would leave with you know, their, their jaw on the ground. <laughs> so, and, and I think they would relay the information to Bill at some point. Um, and, and to Bill's credit, at, at the end of all of this, he did admit that there was a failure of due diligence on his part he got caught in the trade. Um, he didn't do the, the work that was necessary. He really bought into the Mike Pearson is an, an incredible outsider manager. He can achieve anything. Um, and he bought into that. So he admits that he made a mistake there. <laughs> well, chapeau to him. And, and also a lesson for all of us that even the, the best and the brightest can make mistakes, yes. especially if they don't do due, due diligence. Uh, so how do you start? Because there are so many companies in the world. And uh, how, what is, uh, I don't want to you to reveal the trade secret, but what is your strategy and think about uh, how to short? So if you look around, there aren't really any short only funds. You have short bias funds, you have short funds that are hedged against the market, but you don't have any short only funds. We are high conviction, as in we take concentrated bets against the market, and we are completely unhedged against the market. So at any given time, I'm running you know, somewhere between you know, minus 100% to, I think, minus 140 percent um, if things are really going well. Uh, so we really need to make sure that we're right. Mm -hmm. um, and high conviction trades, really, it's a, about concentration. So we need to be able to look at a small group of names and really know that these are the best ideas that we can possibly short and really become experts in those names. Um, what I've seen, you know, as far as my experience shorting stocks and going back to, you know, the village elders of the short selling community and understanding what worked for them, fraud is usually a good place to start um, as far as shorting stocks because, you know, fundamentals can always be weak um, and um, financials can always be misleading, especially in this sort of a world where companies are rewarded for obfuscating their financials as much as possible. So. Um, in order to really have a company that's going to collapse, you need to have some sort of criminal element to it. That's, that, that's almost a surefire way um, to make, be able to make money. Not, nothing is ever sure, but it's the best you can get. So for us, we're focused on fraud. Um, so it was really an academic um, undertaking to kind of go through the history of frauds um, and dis, you know, strip away all of the... Uh, various nuances of each company and really understand what's at the core of these businesses and how we can identify them if we are just going through corporate filings. Um, and this, is, this wasn't just to benefit me, but I had to hire uh, my analyst. And, and um, my analyst, Christina, has, like me, did not have any prior investment experience. So I had to show her, give her a nice way to go through filings and uh, categorize these companies in terms of potential fraud. Uh, so we came up with these archetypes fraudulent archetypes, and she, she'd print them out and, you know, put them on a big poster in front of her computer. And basically, you can read through management discussion and analysis and 
certain signals and certain types of business models all can be categorized in these archetypal terms. Um, and then that really starts as a starting off point um, for due diligence. Um, and then going from there, I would say 5% of it is financial analysis because they're brilliant. Only analysts. five. Yeah, I, I would say because <laughs> going back to my point about corporate um, you know, misrepresentation of financial statements, it happens all the time. The, the most, you know, the, the best companies, the most ethical companies on a publicly traded ex exchange are probably engaged in some level of financial shenanigans. So that can't be the core of our investment thesis. Though it is our starting off point, we, we do need to understand where are the weaknesses in the fundamentals um, and reading you know, between the lines. And ultimately, as a short seller, we focus mostly on the balance sheet, um, less on the income statement, um, just because there's less you can manipulate. And then for us, it's really about taking those financials and, and adding color and context through investigative work. And that means going out into the world, doing shoe leather work, um, going, sitting outside of warehouses, diving into dumpsters, building out sources, uh, meeting with whistleblowers. That's really what drives the investment forward. But so you hire a lot of the journalists that uh, used to do investigative journalists for the ma main newspapers or the local newspapers now are fired and you hire them and you put them at work? <laughs> no, but they, are, they, they do make good advisors. <laughs> we, we try to do as much work as possible on our own. Um, it, it gets difficult because we are across um, multiple markets. So it's, it's not as easy for me to you know, take a car and, and go to uh, Cape Town um, to go to a factory. So really, um, we use a lot. Uh, if we are hiring someone, it's a private investigator. Um, who is certified to kind of collect this information, just because we also need to be mindful of the ethics of um, investment research um, and making sure we don't get, gain access to any non-public information. Um, so uh, we, we don't hire ex journalists, but they do make good uh, advisors and drinking buddies. <laughs> so why, why don't you hire ex journalists? Um, well, I think some, sometimes ex journalists still will publish work. Mm -hmm. um, so. For me, it's more of a personal decision. I think um, the ethics are much clearer when we have someone who's certified in private investigations. I see. And uh, can you share with, with us your archetypes? What are the archetypes of fraud? Um, well, it's, it really comes down to the, the key one is financial fraud. Um, but every company that we short has some element of financial fraud. Um, but then there's you know, corporate governance is one of the archetypes. Um, and then we have um, elder fraud. Uh, pump and dumps, uh, healthcare, um, and then we also have obsolescence. So companies that are, you know, that may have been run in a an ethical fashion at, at one point. Once they start to be to lose their competitive moat um, and become uh, weaker fundamentally, that usually compels them to commit some element of fraud. So we had last year a accounting professor at HBS who wrote uh, why they do it uh, about corporate fraud. Um, do you use this kind of literature to guide you or do you think that we academics uh, are wasting their time and uh, you have a much better method? Uh, no, <laughs> I, I, I respect that type of work and as someone who comes from a very technical STEM sort of background, so much of what I have had to learn is people and behavior uh, because what we often see is that the psychology of management and you know, increasing erraticism um, and uh, you know, their decision-making patterns often will precipitate actual fundamental weakening or uh, frauds unraveling within their businesses. So understanding people and you know, the, why they make the decisions they do is really fundamental to our process. And it's, it's something where I you know, learn from, from academics and other fields um, on a daily basis. So on the human psychology of fraud? Yes. Okay. Um, the, I would say the, the personality characteristics between folks that are engaged in any type of crime, ultimately very similar. Um, and what, one thing that we do that I, I feel a lot of short sellers avoid um, is speak to management. Um, so the short sellers will tell you we don't speak to management because we think we'll be bamboozled. I think 
if you think you're going to be bamboozled by these executives, maybe don't be a short seller. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that, that isn't um, you know, why we avoid speaking to management. Uh, we like speaking with management because it helps us establish a psychological baseline of the companies that we're examining and, and the management teams that we're interacting with. So what we know as we're diligencing a, a company, as we're investigating, you know, over time we'll, we'll meet with management. And as that investment starts to progress and as we start to make money on that idea, you know, how does management behavior change? Usually, you know, they'll be very polite in the first meeting. They might not answer our questions, but they will give us, you know, a polite no comment. Um, but then, you know, progressively they'll start to get sweaty. Um, you know, the, the micro expressions that they have on, uh, you know, that's something that we'll examine as far as when they're approached with those difficult questions. And then towards the end, they'll just start throwing temper tantrums. <laughs> Speaking of uh, managers good, good at bamboozing people, what about Tesla? <laughs> what about Tesla? <laughs> so it, it's, it's amusing because, uh, you know, we, I, I, I went to lunch with Bloomberg and we spoke, I think, about 20 different names. Um, they just wanted the headline. You know, valiant short sellers decides to start shorting Tesla. Um, whereas, you know, Tesla is something I've spoken at length about at various forums. Um, you know, there are certainly the archetypal elements of a company that is committing fraud. Um, but we avoid hype. We avoid mania stocks. Generally because, again, we're trying to be sustainably short and make money over the long term and stay in business. You know, we don't want to be another statistic of a short seller that's either retired or commit suicide. So <laughs> for us, we've avoided Tesla. Um, so what got us into the position? Again, it came down to the fundamentals um, and the fact that the, the balance sheet was just at a point that was unsustainable. The working capital manipulations and um, the amount of leverage again, seemed like an attractive entry point, coupled with the fact that there was massive accounting executive departures. That being said, we kept it a small position because we knew that they would continue to ma manipulate. And we knew that the, the mania still, while it was starting to subside, it was still there. They're still your diehard Teslarians. So uh, for us, we kept the position small. Um, but now we think you know this past quarter is probably the best they will do as far as their numbers and as and you know when we've examined what they did to attain those numbers we don't think that is repeatable so since Q3 uh, we've started to build our position. Wow so you try to do everything to avoid shorting but eventually was such an appealing target that you ended up doing it. Well I, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm not stupid so when, when you know it, with, with Tesla the, the short thesis is basically open sourced uh, you, you, you have a name where you're seeing the thesis being created in real time by people from, you know, experienced investors to academics to just random people who have some time on their hands. They're all contributing to this thesis long or short. And it's, I, I love seeing this happen. I think that's a great, you know, sh social media has played such a great role in allowing for this sort of discourse to happen. Um, so I would be stupid to not appreciate it. Um, and for us, you know, it'll certainly take us a lot more work on our own independent work to build up a higher conviction position uh, than we do now. But um, it's, it's hard to avoid nowadays. <laughs> but also I read that uh, you are targeting some South African companies. Mm -hmm. can, uh, can you elaborate on that? Yeah. So one thing that we like to look for are blow ups, corporate blow ups um, in specific markets. Um, Define so as? Um, you know, a high-profile company that's completely collapsed okay. um, in an otherwise stable market. So, you know, Canada was, you know, one place that we had looked after the collapse of, of Home Capital Group and the exposure of the mortgage orig origination fraud there. Um, South Africa, we were looking at Steinhoff. Mm -hmm. So short selling isn't very popular in South Africa. It's not a very mature market, um, especially for short selling. Um, but suddenly you have one of the biggest companies – in South Africa, suddenly collapse, basically go bankrupt. Um, and suddenly you have investors concerned about all of the other companies in South Africa. Are these companies also engaged in similar levels of fraud and criminality? Um, you have regulators that were asleep at the wheel 
um, and basically complicit with the crimes that were being committed. That is not just South Africa. <laughs> that, that, that's not just South Africa, but the, but but when when that when something when an event like this occurs, mm -hmm. then even though you wanted to turn your cheek and and avoid um, getting involved and and avoid regulating, now you don't really have a choice because so much money has been lost, um, and you know, money lost along with the government, uh, the, the shifting tide with the Zuma regime, you know, being cut out and now there's this push to uh, limit corruption in South Africa. You're finally seeing firms like KPMG and McKinsey basically being kicked out by a lot of these companies because they were complicit um, in uh, the corruption in the government, but also with uh, blow ups like Steinhoff. So finally, it creates a bit of you know opportunity because when investors are jittery, when regulators feel the pressure, then finally uh, companies that are engaged in wrongdoing, you might be able to profit off of exposing them. Um, so, you know, we started to, to dig deeper, and there's certainly a lot more that's going wrong. And a lot of that comes down to um, the socioeconomic dynamics um, in South Africa that have lent uh, to exploitation. And, you know, when you see exploitative practices, when you see margins that are better than usual, um, then again, it's, it's something that, as short sellers, we find very attractive. So, um, We've certainly focused on it as a market, but it's been difficult. Um, you know, one of the firms that we respect, uh, Viceroy Research, they, they're an activist. They, they publish a lot in South Africa. They had published about Steinhoff. Uh, they, uh, the, uh, uh, basically, a group of South African companies hired private investigators to go after the short sellers. And they published a long report about you know, the cabal of short sellers and how they're working to you know, bring down the South African economy. Um, but really, we're just bringing, you know, weeding out the bad actors. And the cabal was you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it was myself, um, a few other short sellers, um, journalists, the whole lot. But I, I have to say, you don't uh, look like the typical uh, member of a cabal. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, most seriously, I think that... Uh, uh, there are not a lot of women in Wall Street and not women running hedge funds, especially at age 27. Uh, but in particular, there are not a lot of women who are shorter. So, uh, short, short, that short, uh, short seller. Uh, and uh, so, how does sort of uh, your different experience uh, help you be what you are? Well, you know, I would say short selling is a good place for me simply because everyone is an outsider. You know, all of the other, no, none of the short sellers look like traditional Wall Street folks. You know, they're not wearing their very fancy, you know, tailored suits. They all have a, a bit of a, a quirk about them. Uh, a lot of them ha will have a chip on their shoulder. And they, they sort of work outside of the confines of Wall Street. Uh, so short sellers are willing to sort of accept anyone. Um, and for a, lot, a long time, the short sellers just knew me as the assassin, and they thought the assassin was, you know, some dude. <laughs> so they were very surprised to see it was me. Um, but either way, it's, it, they have a very unique understanding of, of facts um, and, and being right and, and appreciation for, for hard work. So because, I, you know, by virtue of being a short seller, I was automatically accepted into a community, you know, it's this merry band of misfits. Um, that is, that's very supportive because it's a dwindling group, um, but they really want to see um, short selling survive, fundamental short selling survive. So I was always supported within that group. Um, but why did I start a hedge fund at 27? You know, why not you know, work at another fund? Why not stay at my old fund, given um, the kind of investment making power I had? And that's because, yeah, it's, it's hard for women on Wall Street. And I've never really been someone who can stand there and, you know, take it. Um, I've had the fortune of being in circumstances where I've been encouraged to speak my mind. Um, I've never had to go through the, you know, Wall Street world of, um, you know, this is how you do it. You keep your head down. Um, you, you take the comments, all of that. You know, I don't have patience for it. And I've never had to. So fortunately, um, I was just able to step away from it. And given the support I had from the short selling community to just go and, and do my own thing. And hopefully that will serve as an example um, to others who 
have no choice but to take it. Yeah, it's 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 hard for me because I I, I hear about how hard it is for women, you know, people of color on Wall Street. Um, but at the same time, it's it's not something I've I've necessarily had to experience directly, just because I I was fortunate enough to step away, and that's part of why I decided to kind of be more public and take the speaking engagements, come here, um, because I think it's important for people to hear from someone like me. But you keep repeating some characteristics that are useful for social sellers that characterize you, characterize the community. Uh, what is in your education? If you have to tell uh, um, us, older people who have uh, daughters, etc., how sort of uh, how to raise our daughters so they become like you? <laughs> well, I, you know, maybe it's it really is just about encouraging intellectual curiosity. Um, you know, that's with mathematics. It was all about asking questions and. You know, the, the way my parents raised me, it was never, you know, do this, do this, do this. It was more of just sort of naturally allowing me to develop and, and be curious and, and be fierce um, and, and learn to make mistakes and learn from those mistakes. Um, I, I sort of just developed on my own. Um, and even within short selling, you know, the, the best mentors I had were not the ones who were, you know, giving me an idea to look at. It, it was the ones who allowed me to progress and, and learn things on my own. Um, even if it took me a bit of time, at least uh, through that process, I could have ownership of what I was doing and what I was learning. Um, so I think it really comes down to understanding what you're passionate about and asking questions and leaving yourself exposed and vulnerable to whatever it is you can experience, positive or negative. Um, because it's not as though I planned to become this. You know, it was just because I allowed myself to experience certain things and be open to these um, uh, new ways of thinking and, and ideas that got me where I am. Uh, I don't know if... So, so there isn't something you can really study. Uh, it's more about being honest with yourself, not having an end goal in mind. Yeah, but certainly a set of values that you were raised with that are quite important and successful. So I think your, your parents are probably very proud of you. <laughs> they are, yeah. Good. So I am having a lot of fun asking your question, but I think I want to share this with the, the audience. So uh, there are a couple of uh, microphones around. Please raise your hands and wait for the microphone to come and uh, then uh, ask a question. Are you all uh, intimidated yet? back there? There is a first question. So um, you mentioned fraud. You mentioned consulting firms several times, but you never mentioned them in the same sentence. Should you have? I, I thought I did when I was speaking about South Africa. So uh, <laughs> what's going on in South Africa now with the, the Zuma regime being cleared out um, and this you know, wave now against corruption, KPMG, an auditing firm, and McKinsey, a consulting firm, are basically now being blacklisted by companies in South Africa because they've been complicit in criminality and in fraud. And you, what I saw at Malian and, and what we've, we saw at Enron, there were certainly a lot of folks from a certain consulting firm that were very involved in the aggressive tactics. And usually when you're so laser focused on aggressively attaining profits in a way that no one else is, then it's, it's not that hard to cross the line into fraudulent behavior. Quick follow-up on that. Yeah. Should the SEC require companies to um, disclose their relationships, the length of that tenure, and the amount spent per year, much the way they do with auditing firms? Yeah, I agree. I, I, I do think that fees to consulting firms should be disclosed. But, again, wishful thinking. <laughs> yes, over here. Um, uh, is this on? Um, I was wondering if you had any words of caution for people that hear your story and think that, you know, I'm going to start shorting in my basement with my retirement account. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, so, you know, I, this is, this is something I tell other friends who run portfolios. You know, if anyone sat in my seat and saw my intraday P and L, um, I think they would have a heart attack because the amount of volatility that we're up against, um, you know, with sh companies that are actively 
working to manipulate the market, create short squeezes, um, the fact that we have to deal with basically infinite downside risk to our position, um, we have to deal with you know, the risks of lending and th those shares that we've borrowed to be called back at any time. The risks are, you know, outnumber uh, the, the, the profits that you could potentially make shorting. So this has to be something that you are compelled to do. Um, and you know, someone has to have a gun to your head and you still want to short stocks. That's, <laughs> you, otherwise, you know, don't do it. <laughs> But, but the ideas related to short selling, the, the way we approach research, the way we ask questions, um, the, this idea of in the notion of getting to the truth of these companies, I think every investor should do that. You know, if more investors thought about investing like short sellers do, I think we would have a freer, fairer market. Well, I'm waiting for the next question. I want to follow up on this issue of the short squeeze. So companies talk to fund managers and try to tell, convince them not to lend shares to you? So there have been times on conference calls where, you know, smaller mid-cap companies are saying, you know, we are calling back all of our shares that we have on the street. So these short sellers, these naked short sellers can't do anything about it. So companies are actively saying that they're not going to lend shares out anymore. You know, we have Companies um, and you know transfer agents, brokers, all sort of working together to manipulate the float, um, to manipulate the trading. You know we've seen um, in one of the names that we're short, for example, um, actual chats where they're saying, "Oh, we're going to sell low volume. We're going to trigger the uptick rule. So we're going to make sure you know at the open they, it, it'll go down 10% on low volume, and then we're going to pull all of our shares. So we'll create the biggest squeeze. We'll get all the shorts out. We we see chats." You know, with people that are associated with these companies, direct, direct related parties. Isn't that market manipulation? It is market manipulation, and that's why we, <laughs> we, we report it. But again, it, and the it, SEC does not do anything. We we do in this in this specific instance, we do believe they are going to. Okay, but I was saying something more. This is uh, the the bulk. Tell me if I'm wrong, but the bulk of the shares you borrow comes from institutional investors who own those shares. Yeah, it's usually like BlackRock, Fidelity. Yeah, um, so, so is there any company that goes to BlackRock and Fidelity and say, uh, if you want to be my friend, if you want to do this business, you cannot uh, lend uh, shares to FAMI? They, BlackRock, Fidelity, are, you, they usually won't become complicit in something like that. Um, but companies where you are smaller mid-cap, where the, the float is small enough, where you can get the, own, the, the direct owners of the stock, um, you know, related parties to pull their shares. That's where it has more of an impact. Okay. Um, so it, it comes down to, you know, how big is the float? Well, how big is the company asking the question? Right. There was a question over there. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, sorry. Given the unlimited downside risk and the volatility of the PNR, how do you think about the time horizon of your investments? Well, we, we say that um, every short we're in, we, we hope to realize profits within a year. Um, we don't get any sort of long-term capital gains associated with short selling, so there's no reason for us to hold positions for a long time. Um, and the thing is, we want to have best ideas at any given time. So best ideas to me mean we're making money pretty quickly and, and getting out of these positions pretty safely. Um, but that being said, sometimes with these companies, the fraud is, you know, it's never a straight line down. Um, so we will trade in and out of positions, take profits where it's reasonable, um, and re-enter trades if we need to. So you mentioned after you move past the balance sheet, you start to understand the psychology of the company, and you talked about how once people move past their market leadership, maybe they have no advantage and they start to pursue options for fraud. I was curious about whether you consider the HR performance management system and how you think about human resources and the way employees are incentivized when you profile the psychology of the company. Yeah, absolutely. When we do due diligence on corporate governance, it really comes down to how companies are um, incentivizing th their executives. Um, and we've become, you know, this market where companies are so, you know, executives are so rewarded based on stock performance rather than company fundamentals themselves. And, you know, naturally, it's just common sense that what happens there is that, you know, they are incentivized to increase the stock price, whether that means um, through the real, you know, changes at the company, but usually it just means buybacks. Um, so that, that's certainly one thing that we look at. 
Um, one thing we like to look at is stock-based compensation just generally, um, because usually that can be used as a lever to, again, sort of misrepresent the financial health of the company. Um, so companies where you are financially ca or cash constrained, you'll start moving more of your um, employee compensation into stock. Um, so that's one uh, place that one line item that we certainly like to look at. Um, we've also um, seen instances where um, egregious levels of stock-based compensation um, indicate that there's something fishy going on with the actual number of shares that have been issued. Um, and then when we start to dig deeper into what's driving um, that number being so outrageously high, what we saw was that the company was basically taking stock and rewarding it to um, not employees, but to customers um, and distributors of uh, that company's products. And then those distributors and those customers were taking loans out against the stock uh, to, to purchase the company's products. So uh, stock-based compensation is certainly one item that we look at as far as potentially uncovering um, fraud. But I, I do agree with, I think, where your question was going um, as far as it does, um, we do see a correlation between high levels of stock-based compensation and um, potentially unethical behavior. Farmy, thanks a lot for coming in. Um, personally, I'm starting my career at a mall only at T. Rowe Price next year, so I hope we're never on the opposite sides of that <laughs> trade. Uh, but what advice would you have for those of us who are going into the law only side? You know, what aspects of companies do you wish, hey, you know, I wish the guy at Capital or T. Rowe would look into this aspect of the company a little bit more? So I really think you, you, anyone, long or short, needs to be asking more questions. I think we've come to a world where so much is at our fingertips now. Um, you know, all, we have all of the data. We can purchase all of you know, this propri these proprietary data sets that are supposed to tell us the answer to everything. Um, and that's given us an excuse not to go and pick up a phone, not to go and meet with, uh, with companies and you know, the customers of those companies. So I think um, no matter which side you're on, I think we can't lose sight of you know, really just that human level of, of research. Um, it's not just about the data sets. Um, and that, that isn't just, you know, because I'm old-fashioned. I, I think it also has to do with if you want to have investment edge, um, there's always going to be someone with, you know, billions of dollars, like a T. Rowe, um, you know, uh, trillions of dollars. They can buy whatever data they want. So how do you differentiate yourself against them? You know, it's about going out and doing the work that they don't want to do. Over here. Um, how much profit do you like to see before you close your short positions? Uh, what we tell investors is 60%. And that's only, you know, I fundamentally believe that most of the names that we put, you know, are terminal, let's say. Um, so when I go to sleep, I sleep very well. I sleep like a baby at night because the next morning, most of these companies could be gone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a good position to be in as a short seller, but there's also the danger of getting too emotionally tied to your thesis, and then you know something is is down, but you want it to go to zero, so you just keep holding the position. But you know it, it could go up fifty percent, sixty percent before it goes to zero. So for for me, it's really I have to, as a portfolio manager, need to be judicious about being able to take profit. So I tell investors sixty percent, and then at that point, I start looking at should I take profits or um, how do I, you know, adjust the position size accordingly? So, over there. Thank you so much. My question is, um, you use a lot of data. So, how do you decide um, what is your data source? And then second, how do you, what is your process for data aggregation so that you can make your final decision? <laughs> if only there was a clear answer to that. Um, so everything that we, we it's, it's really on a case-by-case -case basis. There are some companies where, you know, the amount of due diligence really just comes down to assessing the publicly available financial information um, and then doing a little bit of investigative work to give us the conviction to um, initiate a position. But then there are cases where, you know, we're speaking to hundreds of different sources on a name <laughs> Um, so it, it does get very uh, difficult, but I wouldn't say that there's we necessarily have 
uh, professional processes in place as far as aggregating that data. Um, what it starts with is the fundamental analysis. Um, and when we go through the financials, assessing what are the vulnerabilities in the, in the company that we need to explore further in order to make money on the trade. Um, so that's really where we narrow down our, our data set. Um, it's, it's about assessing, you know, if we're able to show this, then, and, and we're able to expose that information, then we do believe the stock price will go down accordingly. Um, so it's about keeping the, the uh, research questions themselves narrow, and that helps us better focus the actual data collection effort. Over there. Thank you. You touched on the risks of uh, share borrowing. Um, could you comment on how you overcome the risk of the borrowing costs eating through your returns? So I'm in a very fortunate position today where most of my shorts, I'm actually getting paid to borrow. And even two years ago, that wasn't the case. Um, and even the most shorted name in my portfolio, um, the most difficult to borrow, I'm only paying 9%. So I think generally the borrowing environment has gone a bit um, more amenable for short sellers. Um, but on top of that, you know, though we're a small fund, I have three prime brokers. So I, I do whatever I can to manage my counterparty risk and sort of pit my brokers against each other. Um, you know, there's there's one, one of my prime brokers offers a software where um, it feeds in broker um, information from all of my brokers, and I see total transparency as far as the margins that my brokers are getting on each share that they lend out. Um, so I can then use that information to negotiate if I ever need to. Um, so, so far, um, even on a name like uh, Mimetics, if, if any of you have followed that, I've never had to deal with a recall. Um, and I've, I've never had to deal with an, a situation where I couldn't borrow shares. Over there. Uh, thank you for being with us today. Uh, what role do expert networks play in your due diligence and, in your experience, to the extent you've used expert networks, have uh, private investigators proved to be a better source uh, of information? Thank you. <laughs> are you from the SEC? <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I worked at a buy-side fund, and I just think expert <laughs> networks are kind of a rip-off. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. We, we don't use any expert networks. Um, you know, when I, when I first worked at my, my old fund, um, it, that was always the thing that, you know, during a mock audit, did they ask you, do you use expert networks? And when I was in consulting, we also didn't use expert networks because there's no replacement for building out your own sources and um, being able to develop that sort of relationship and, and get questions answered that way. Um, you know, when you're hiring someone to find your source for you and then you're paying that source, again, it's not necessarily the most effective way to, to gain information. So for us, even though it takes more time, um, and isn't necessarily um, successful as far as hit rate, um, there's no replacement for building up your own network of sources. And that's why private investigators are so useful because they have decades of experience building out those networks and they have those relationships and they know um, the right way to obtain information. Over there, Nito. Thank you for coming today. Um, I was curious, because you mentioned that the range that you think of with your portfolio is rather on the short range, how do you split your time or the company's time between sourcing sort of preliminary information and, get, and understanding which companies you might be interested to short, as opposed to more um, deep dive on companies that you're already shorting or already decided that you potentially want to short? Yeah, so the, the virtue of being so exclusively focused on short selling and, and specifically shorting frauds is that... Um, I've been building this universe of potential frauds for some time now. Um, and you're so, when you're embedded in that world, you also are exposed, you know, whistleblowers come to us regularly. Um, we, we hear from other investors, we um, hear from private equity firms. So all of that helps to build out the, the sort of, um, all of the names that we, we sort of will do initial due diligence on. But again, it comes down to those archetypes. So all of these companies within our universe have to fulfill um, at least three of those archetypes that um, we've, um, we've come up with. And then after that, it's a matter of timing. So we'll do the initial financial analysis, and if there's anything that really is outstanding about the, the financials that 
indicate that the company's fundamentals are, are at a tipping point or some sort of inflection, then we'll do deep dive investigative work. Um, and if they're not, they sort of go on the back burner, um, and then we'll get the regular news flow and see as other signals come up, will they be worth uh, reinvestigating um, to see if uh, the timing is right. So uh, it's, it's very much an organic process. Um, but the, the way in order to maintain in intellectual objectivity across all of our investments is everyone that you know as, is at SOPCAT is looking at every single name. Um, so far, the idea generation is largely, you know, s still comes from me. Um, but the way I envision it, even when the, the team is, you know, when we've hired everyone um, that we see fit for the team, everyone will be looking at every name so that there's always a check um, and there's always a challenge. Because so much of the problem within, in, is, with investing is when you get stuck in an echo chamber and you don't really have um, someone who's questioning the way you think. And that happens on the short side all the time, long and short. <laughs> so I think we are running out of time. Last uh, very brief question. Where is the name SoftCat coming from? <laughs> Five minutes of Googling. So <laughs> as, as a math geek, um, you know, I wanted a math goddess um, to, for the fun name. You know, Athena was taken. So I, I did some Googling, and then I, I found out about SoftCat. And I searched. No one had taken the name before. And... Here we are. <laughs> Say la vie. So she's an a Egyptian goddess of yes. mathematics. Yes, ancient and... Egyptian goddess of mathematics, accounting, knowledge, wisdom. So That sounds perfect. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>